before I begin, sort of a little bit of the, the why we did this exhibit. Um, as you may have noticed, anytime you go out driving, uh, there are more and more electric cars on Canadian streets than ever before. Um, the moment it's about 5% of uh, vehicles on roads are electric cars uh, North America wide. Um, in Canada, we're looking at about more than 100,000 sold between 2019 and 2020 and about a similar amount 2020 to 2021. We don't have the 2022 sales figures just yet. Uh, so now seemed like a great time to talk about the surprisingly deep roots of the electric car in this country. Uh, we've already covered the early stages in the first half of this presentation, which you can find on our CAM YouTube, uh, sorry, CAM Curator YouTube channel, um, or through the Canadian Society for the Decorative Arts. Um, recommend you check that out for some background. Uh, but this talk will cover, again, 1940 to about the present day. <coughs> and I apologize in advance, uh, this section leans very heavily on the in Canada and beyond part of this electric car story, uh, because when you're talking about electric cars since the Second World War, you really can't not tell an international story. Uh, but let's begin by sort of rewinding and taking a look at the state of the industry circa 1939-ish. So just before the Second World War, the electric passenger vehicle market had functionally ceased to exist uh, worldwide. Electric passenger cars just really hadn't kept up with the rise of gasoline engines and gasoline vehicles, their drops in price, better availability, cheaper fuel. Um, and while the industry wasn't gone, it had really switched tax towards the commercial and industrial sectors. Um, electric delivery trucks were very common in Europe. Um, that's a uh, Skoda built uh, electric truck being used to transport uh, beer in Pilsen in uh, Czechoslovakia there. Um, transport vehicles like lumber trucks uh, in North America at the top right there and electric forklifts at the bottom right were quite common. Um, and uh, as we saw in our previous talk, in sort of the years just before the Second World War, there was still a kind of the last dregs of an electric taxi industry, uh, primarily in Spain, which was recovering from the after effects of the Spanish Civil War um, and shortages of things like uh, gasoline and engine parts. Uh, and as we'll see, it was actually shortages of gasoline and engine parts that led to a very, very brief, limited kind of indirect renaissance of electric and hybrid vehicle technology during the Second World War. Uh, so in our previous talk, we talked a little bit about Ferdinand Porsche and his important work on what we today call a series hybrid. Um, that's a vehicle with a gasoline generator driving an electric motor that turns the wheels. Um, it's got great torque, great power, very good fuel economy, but at the time at least it was extremely complicated and expensive. Um, Porsche had abandoned commercial and passenger hybrids, but was very keen on their military applications. Um, and uh, he built quite a few hybrid vehicles during the Second World War. Um, at the top right there, uh, you can see a Panzerjäger Tiger P, uh, also called the Ferdinand or the Elephant. Um, that's a self-propelled anti-tank gun on a Porsche hybrid chassis, uh, which 91 were built, and they did see uh, combat on the Eastern and Western fronts during the Second World War. Uh, to the left there, that very large, chunky vehicle is uh, Porsche's uh, sort of magnum opus, his great folly, the uh, Panzer VIII Mouse, the heaviest tank ever built, uh, give or take uh, 200 tons of German steel powered by a Porsche hybrid drivetrain. Uh, only two of those were ever made and they never saw combat, but this gives you the idea. Hybrid technology was around a lot during the Second World War. Uh, the Allies experimented with it. At the bottom right there, you can see the TOG Two Star, the uh, largest or one of the largest tanks ever built in England. Uh, it was a hybrid on a Porsche design. And uh, the US, United States and the Soviets also sort of captured these kinds of vehicles, experimented with them, and generally speaking, determined that while the technology was interesting for things like uh, train locomotives, where it's still used to this day, wasn't really practical in the um, military application. Um, on the civilian side of things, though, wartime electrics were kind of flourishing. Um, so there wasn't just rationing of gasoline and engines during the Second World War. You're also looking at rationing on things like rubber tires, um, lubricants, uh, fan belt material, everything you can think of that would go into the large scale production of gasoline engines. Uh, and this leaves lots of people across North America to dig out old electric cars, refurbish them and keep driving them because they work their way around these shortages. Um, 
in some places, demand for transport of any kind is so great as to spur the entirely new production of entirely new vehicles. Um, the interesting looking car on the left there is a uh, Renault VLV, uh, sorry, a Peugeot VLV rather. Um, this was a sort of three and a half wheeler. It's technically a four wheeler, but the back two wheels are right next to each other. Uh, car built by Peugeot. Uh, during the war, they made about 500 of them. They were electric powered and they were basically to take up production slack in the company's factories um, and make them some money in parts of France where they weren't permitted to keep working on war material. Um, the Breguet Aircraft uh, Company of France also made their own little electric car. Um, and in Japan, post-war, the Japanese government actually subsidized the new production of electric cars. Um, again, engine shortage, gasoline shortages, they needed something to get the economy rolling again. Um, so the boxy little truck you see on the right there um, is a Tokyo Electric Automobile Company Tama, uh, an award-winning uh, light taxi cab truck combo powered by lead-acid batteries, um, produced by a company that would actually go on to become well, what is now Nissan. Um, that being said, though, for all that these electrics enjoyed a brief vogue of popularity, the moment gasoline rationing went away um, and the wartime post or post-war economic boom started up, uh, suddenly electrics are not a particularly viable proposition anymore, and they go dormant again. Um, and we're going to see this a lot in this presentation is sort of brief flowerings of electric activity and then they go dormant and they flower and they go dormant over and over again over the course of the second half of the 20th century. Um, so in the sort of 50s and 60s, there are a few attempts to revive electric technology, um, mainly or at least initially due to new actually breakthroughs in battery tech um, developed during the war and immediately afterwards. Um, and also spurred by sort of growing uh, environmentalism and the increasing popularity of compact cars on North American streets. Uh, one of the biggest early ones is uh, the Henny Motor Company. Um, they were a coach works, a car bodybuilder affiliated with Packard, which had been famous for many years as the car of United States presidents. Um, unfortunately, by the 50s, Packard was doing quite poorly. They would go bankrupt a few years later. Um, so Henny was basically looking to diversify their portfolio through a bunch of mergers. Uh, they bought Eureka Williams, the vacuum cleaner company famous for Eureka vacuums, um, and eventually came under the control of National Union Electric Company. Um, so in 59, uh, Henny bought the rights to the body and chassis of the very popular Renault Dauphine, which looks like this vehicle you can see on the screen here. This is a very popular um, French made uh, compact city car. Um, and Henny collaborated with Renault um, and with Caltech um, and with Eureka to basically design a power system that would fit inside the Dauphine and could theoretically be used to make an inexpensive uh, compact electric city car. Uh, the vehicle they came up with um, had a range of about 64 kilometers at a maximum speed of 64 kilometers per hour. Uh, they later pumped this up to about uh, 96 kilometers per hour with a range of just shy of 100 kilometers. Um, unfortunately, though, uh, Henny was primarily a uh, body works. They were not a car distributor and they didn't really have dealerships or a good distribution network set up to sell these things. Um, they only made about 100 kilowatts, uh, only sold around 47 of them um, for a price of about 3,600 US dollars. It was, it was quite expensive for a compact car um, and they really didn't go anywhere commercially. Um, not long after Henny was sort of on their way out, um, out in California, uh, the Nickel Silver Battery Company um, of Santa Clara uh, developed quite an unusual concept for an electric car and one that at least on paper was extremely promising commercially. Um, so they were looking at the Alkin, which was an extremely popular um, home conversion for a Volkswagen Beetle. Basically, if you fit a Beetle with a very, very lightweight fiberglass body, um, even though the Beetle's engine isn't particularly powerful, uh, if it's not pushing any weight, it can be quite fast. Uh, so Alkins were these zippy, stylish, very sexy little sports cars that everybody was driving around back in about 58, 59. Um, so Nickel Silver licensed this design and decided to use it as the framework for an electric car. Uh, and they were using, well, Nickel Silver over batteries. Um, this was a technology that had actually been developed in the 1930s um, and had gotten some use during the Second World War for things like rockets and missiles. Uh, nickel silver batteries are very energy dense and, and quite sturdy and reliable. They just hold way more power per weight than lead acid batteries do. Um, so um, nickel silver put together a prototype with uh, well 12 batteries in the trunk, um, an eight horsepower electric motor at each rear wheel, um, and they advertised a top speed of about 80 kilometers per hour with a maximum range of 
give or take 240 kilometers. Uh, and you could supposedly charge it from a wall socket in about you know, six or seven hours. Um, for the time, this is extremely impressive performance. This is not bad even by modern electric car standards. Um, whole car weighs about 1800 pounds, uh, including battery weight. Um, and they said that basically you could get the car for about 2000 bucks. Uh, and then every few years, you need to spend another 300 to get your battery swapped out. Um, so there was a great deal of media hype. Um, the, the first road tests, the prototype, you can see on the right there, were uh, quite successful. Uh, by all accounts, it had very good performance. Um, and then by about 1961, Nickel Silver drops the project and quietly shoves it under the rug. They only ever make three cars. Um, and we don't know exactly why, but uh, best guess is, uh, well, Nickel Silver's, their big flaw is that while they hold a lot of power, if you repeatedly charge and then discharge them over and over again, like you do when you know driving an electric car and then recharging it overnight, they tend to lose their ability to hold the charge way, way faster faster than lead acid batteries do. Uh, so it may have been that over time, at least, these uh, nickel silver cars did not quite live up to the hype. Uh, and this is sort of a classic example of what I've taken to calling the battery problem. The technology for electric cars is all there. The distribution networks are all there. But the batteries just suck. And we'll see the battery problem come back over and over again over the course of this talk. So on the larger corporate end of things, uh, General Motors is also working on electric cars in this time period. Um, so they basically had gone through a bit of a, a corporate drubbing in the United States Senate. Um, Ralph Nader, later famous as sort of the car safety guru, had publicly accused GM and the other big car manufacturers of pretty much hoarding electric car technology for themselves to deliberately keep it off the roads. Um, and in response to these accusations, GM went on this big sort of crash course between about 1964 and 1969 of developing a whole range of electric and hybrid cars, A, to show off their fancy new tech and their, you know, cutting edge science and research and development, and B, to show that no, they weren't hoarding this technology, it wasn't really practical for street use yet. That was sort of their ulterior motive. Um, and the, the sort of capstone, the, the centerpiece of this whole program was the Electrovair, and it's sibling the Electrovair 2, uh, an electric Corvair sports car. Um, and uh, well, to talk more about it, I'll uh, turn things over to GM's own words from 1966. When you first see it, Electrovair looks like any other car. But when you get into it, 500 volts replaces the fuel tank, and an electric motor takes the place of an engine. Forward or reverse is selected with a standard gear shift lever. The smoothest possible acceleration is provided by the solid state controls. Electrovair 2 can accelerate as quickly as a standard Corvair, even with a full load of passengers. Once underway, Electrovair 2 gives a new sensation in driving. There is no engine noise or vibration. All you hear is the hum of electricity pulsing through the controls. The car handles normally in every way except for braking. There is no engine drag to help slow down Electrovair 2. Therefore, higher performance brakes are used. Additional electronic controls could be added to give dynamic braking. The solid state controls for Electrovair 2 are behind the rear seat. You can see the heavy cables used to handle the high currents required. Electrovair 2 was built as a test bed for motor and control development. Road tests of the complete car are the only way to find out whether a motor control system will work under everyday driving conditions. Typical traffic driving requires starting, stopping, following, passing, all with smooth, positive control of power. As we press the accelerator, our controls must accurately supply extremely high currents to the motor, as much as 500 amps, to quickly and safely pass other vehicles. Electrovair 2 can only travel 40 to 80 miles, depending on how you drive it before its silver zinc batteries must be recharged. Recharging takes almost six hours. Obviously, for most driving, a better battery must be found to make a practical car. But Electrovair 2 has demonstrated for the first time what electric car performance could be like 
when that better power source is found. So there you have it. The battery problem strikes again in their own words. Um, Electrovera's uh, ran actually off a silver zinc, not a nickel silver power plant, um, but the same problems were there. They had a limited lifespan and each battery pack cost 160,000 US dollars. That's in 1966 currency. So they were astronomically expensive. Um, and while they showed them off a lot, they, they didn't really go anywhere commercially. Um, there were a few other um, commercial attempts of electric cars in this period. And we have a very rare example of one actually driven and used in Canada, uh, however briefly. There we go. So um, Westinghouse, the big uh, electric company, um, was working on their own electric car, they, what they called the Marquette, uh, as a compact commuter vehicle. Um, and it was actually prominently displayed at the 1967 Canadian National Exhibition. Yes, there was an electric car uh, on display at Expo 67. And we have video of it, 10 whole seconds of video of it. Well, 19. So uh, Westinghouse themselves admitted that the Marquette was, quote, transitional uh, in design until they could figure out something better. Uh, but it was uh, hoping to eventually solve the, quote, auto-caused air pollution problem, um, which it didn't do uh, because it was basically an electric golf cart with a fancy shell in it. Um, it was actually slower and shorter range than electric cars in the 1910s, which is kind of embarrassing. Um, and uh, Westinghouse made and sold less than 500 of them. And again, quietly shelled the project. It just wasn't worth it. So for the rest of the late 60s and early 70s, uh, the electric car slumbers until there are some fairly major uh, geopolitical shifts that lead to them becoming popular once more. Uh, the big thing is, of course, the energy crises. Uh, from the economic fallout of the Arab-Israeli War in 1973. Uh, to make a very long and very complex geopolitical story short, basically in retaliation for United States military support of Israel, uh, several Middle Eastern nations, chief among them Saudi Arabia, uh, heavily cut both their oil production and their exports of oil to North America. Uh, the end result in North America is skyrocketing oil prices and gasoline shortages, especially in the United States. All of this happens as North America again, mostly the US, but Canada too, are going through this growing idea of energy independence. Um, that, you know, electric cars and electric technology might help us become less dependent on sources of foreign oil. You've got to remember, uh, North American oil industry had just gone through peak oil. Uh, it was importing more oil than it was exporting for the first time in its history. Um, and gas prices were going up and up and up and up, and then these shortages hit. Um, so things like, well, long lines of gas stations, rationing, gas only available every second day, and the classic gas station showing signs saying no gas, that's at a, a station in Oregon there, you can see, became very, very common. Um, the energy crisis concerns were actually redoubled in 1979 with the Iranian oil crisis when Iran shut down the oil production. Um, worldwide, it wasn't really more than a drop in the bucket in terms of international oil production, but it uh, <clears throat> really put the scare on and got a lot of people, A, panic buying gas, and B, very, very interested in suddenly owning electric cars, which you know is a feeling that's quite understandable when we look at gas prices nowadays. Um, so electric cars started to make more of a showing at big public events. Um, that picture on the right is from the 1975 Canadian National Exhibition. Um, and the two electric cars you can see on the right there are um, in the foreground, an Italian Zagato L car. That was a modestly successful Italian electric car from the 70s, and behind it, the Sebring Vanguard City Car, uh, which is the unquestionable winner of the many, many, many small run electric cars developed in response to the oil crisis. Uh, so this is a Sebring Vanguard. It's your classic uh, cheese wedge of a vehicle, uh, again, built on a golf cart platform, but with a little bit more beef to it. Um, and they really were the North American electric car of the energy crisis years. Um, between 1974 and 1982, uh, give or take 6,500 uh, city cars, and then their upgraded variant, the commuter car, were built. Um, and interestingly enough, this production was just large enough to technically make Sebring Vanguard 
which is not at all an auto manufacturer. Um, they were became the US's uh, sixth largest car manufacturer for 1976, just by producing these uh, fairly dinky looking little things. Uh, they weighed about 1300 pounds, were powered by six eight volt lead acid batteries, uh, top speed of about 60 kilometers per hour, uh, depending on weather and the health of the power plant, a uh, range of about 64 kilometers. And they were quite popular in the Southern United States where the warm weather made their batteries more efficient. Again, lots of them were in use in what we would now call Silicon Valley and the sort of uh, wealthier areas of California. Um, and they were you know, reasonably cheap and again, sold fairly well until gas prices dropped again and suddenly they were less immediately necessary. But again, they weren't the only uh, energy crisis car, shall we say. Uh, General Motors resurrected some of the technology used for Electrovair to develop this, Electrovet, uh, first demonstrated in 1978. Uh, this is a Chevette compact car fitted with nickel zinc batteries, which was supposed to be able to manage a moderately respectable range of about 80 kilometers, top speed 85 kilometers per hour. Um, but importantly, Chevette, or sorry, Electrovet rather, was never from the start intended as anything other than a technology demonstrator concept. Uh, they never promised production of these. They never actually demonstrated them at auto shows. They were shown off only at sort of technical and trade shows and secondary venues. Um, and basically what Electrovet was, was like an inexpensive proof of concept prototype car to keep around in the back pocket if GM ever needed to crash develop cheaper electrics in case of further oil issues. You know, they were bragging that um, by, uh, by the mid 1980s, if oil prices kept getting worse, one in uh, 10 cars in North America would be electric. Uh, and that obviously didn't happen. Um, very tellingly though, battery problem strikes again, the final production upgrades of the Electrovet actually dropped their nickel zinc batteries for lead acid ones um, because of performance issues. So yeah, battery problem keeps coming back. Now, in this same time period, we also very excitingly get Canada's first energy uh, or for first uh, electric car in almost 60 years. And that is this delightful creature, uh, the Marathon C300. Um, Marathon Electric was a Montreal, well, is a Montreal-based manufacturer of boat batteries, power plant systems. Um, and uh, they licensed the drivetrain and some components from the Ford Pinto, uh, threw in a little bit of Jeep and came up with a small, modestly priced uh, two-seater electric truck thing, um, available only in yellow, uh, exclusively, uh, top speed of about 60 kilometers per hour with a maximum range of a whopping 50 kilometers. Um, but they were reasonably inexpensive and they came with a slightly larger van upgrade that had a bit better range because, uh, you know, it had bigger battery packs. And that was about all you could ask for from an energy crisis car. They weren't great, but they were immediately available if you were concerned about not paying for expensive or scarce gasoline. Uh, so by 1980, the Marathon C300 was a thing of the past and Marathon Electric continued to turn back to boat motors and things like that. But it was genuinely a Canadian contribution to the field of electric car construction in the 1970s. And that is a very rare thing. Uh, by the early 80s, as I'd mentioned, gas prices have restabilized a little bit, um, and the state of the electric car is kind of perfectly uh, summarized by this attempt uh, from uh, 1980. Uh, the Saskatchewan Power Corporation were doing some research work into the economic viability of electric vehicles in Canada. Uh, so they bought a Colorado-built Electrek, uh, this delightful orange machine here, uh, to test it in Canadian driving conditions, especially Canadian winter driving conditions. This is in uh, they bought it in 1980 and they tested this one in, in 82, I believe. Um, so what they found, practically speaking, was that A, the cold made the battery system so inefficient that the car lost about a third of its predicted range and performance. Um, B, uh, because gas prices were so low, it was actually more expensive to generate the power needed to fully charge the car than it would be to buy an equivalent power quantity of gasoline. Um, and C, the large lead acid battery banks it used were environmentally not great and basically unrecyclable. Um, so they concluded that electric technology just wasn't worth it, again, largely due to the battery problem. So electric so dormant, again. And they stay that way for a fairly long time. Um, until the side effects of a rather unusual bit of public showmanship in 1982. 
Uh, Danish-Australian adventurer Hans Tholstrup, uh, TV personality and general uh, doer of strange and unusual things, uh, in that year crossed Australia in a solar-powered car. Uh, and the media buzz from this uh, spurred the funding and start of what became known as the World Solar Challenge. Uh, this is an international competition open to corporations and universities and private individuals to build their own solar powered cars and then race them across the continent of Australia. Um, the winner of this competition of the give or take 30 entrants um, of whom give or take 13 finished, uh, was this small uh, insect looking vehicle, you can see at the bottom left there, the uh, General Motors Australia Sun Racer, um, a car which absolutely dominated the competition. It beat out the second place competitor by a full 48 hours um, and was a real marvel of um, extremely lightweight car building technology and modern modern for 1987, uh, solar panels. So the win by Sun Racer was very heavily publicized. This is a big multi-day popular event. Um, and it built a ton of positive buzz for General Motors as a company. So spurred on by these good vibes, in 1990, they announced this. This is the impact concept car. Um, they said they would have tens of thousands of them on the road by 2000. Um, and from the test drive and the media did, it seemed like a pretty legit promise. Um, the impact was a genuinely really impressively high performance electric car. It could do like muscle car speeds, insanely high acceleration, uh, could easily do 160, 170 kilometers per hour, you know, like burning rubber, um, except that it hadn't been built by General Motors. It had been built by the same team who did Sunracer. Um, so it was pretty much like the shell of a cool looking concept car uh, held together by good intentions and duct tape and very unstable power plants. Uh, so it was a powerful electric car, but it was nothing like a ready to sell, ready to drive to and from work electric car. And it took GM uh, nine years and almost $2 billion invested in it to make it such. Um, in the meantime, uh, GM's commitment to building a whole heck of a lot of electric cars gets noticed by CARB, the California Air Resources Board. Uh, they were a relatively new body that had been developed to basically uh, help deal with pollution and smog problems in California, uh, partially by being allowed to legislate what kinds of vehicles could be on Californian roads. Um, so in 1990, they pass a mandate stating that by 1998, 5% of all cars on California California roads have to be ZEVs, that is zero emissions vehicles, aka cars where, well, nothing comes out the tailpipe. Um, and it turns out the easiest way to do a zero emissions vehicle with the technology available at the time is to do an electric. By extension, uh, the CARB has now made it legal for big car manufacturers not to sell an electric car of some kind in California. Uh, and given that California is just about the most lucrative electric car market on earth and that cars that sell well there tend to sell well basically everywhere, um, this really aggressively jump starts, pardon the pun, the electric car industry and to a lesser degree the hybrid car industry um, and hybrid car projects among all the big manufacturers. Pretty much everybody who makes cars uh, now has a very, very pressing and urgent reason to start working on electrics of some kind. Uh, GM, of course, is remains the center of this whole buzz. And after nine years, and as mentioned, a great deal of money, they produced this sleek creation, the EV1, which is basically uh, an impact with all of the glitches ironed out. Um, the cars end up being phenomenally expensive. Um, they're actually leased and not sold because they've cost the company so much. Um, and they're genuinely fairly impressive. Uh, they had a reputation for inspiring fairly fanatical gushing loyalty in the people who drove them. Uh, fully upgraded modules could manage about 170 kilometers of range at a top speed of 130 kilometers per hour, again, with very good acceleration. But this time they had stuff like an AM FM radio and a CD player and air conditioning, and that was a big improvement. Um, they earned pretty much universal acclaim from the wealthy Hollywood types who owned them. Uh, among the famous and very outspoken owners of EV1s were none other than uh, Tom Hanks, uh, Danny DeVito, and Jay Leno. Um, but again, they had cost the company a vast amount of money, um, and they were still way, way too expensive to mass produce. Uh, so in 2003, uh, GM, which was now give or take $2 billion in the red in this project, uh, canceled the whole thing, recalled all the cars, stripped out the interiors, sent a couple off to museums, and then completely, literally crushed 
the rest. Um, much to the shock and horror of the people who'd been desperately lobbing GM to not do exactly this for several years and repeatedly offered to buy them. Uh, but that's a whole other story for another presentation. Um, if you'd like to know more about the EV1 and its tragic fate, I'd strongly recommend you check out Chris Payne's documentary, uh, Who Killed the Electric Car? And that was released in 2006. And I believe the whole thing is actually available quite legitimately on YouTube. So if you want to know more about the EV1 story, um, check that out. There is an interesting side note to the EV1 story, and this is a bit of a, a historical mystery I am currently trying to tease out with little success. There is some evidence that EV1s may have been briefly test driven in Canada. There was certainly some test driving in uh, North, the northern United States, uh, in New England, and close to the Canadian border to see how they did in cold weather, which determined Surprise, surprise, they did very badly in cold weather because batteries just don't work very well in cold weather. Um, but it's what we know for certain is that no Canadians drove them and no Canadians ever owned one, but they were driven here by Americans. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, to what extent that happened. Again, big historical question mark there. Uh, but for all that the EV1 is a big, spectacular public boondoggle, it is not the only electric car uh, mandate vehicle out there. There's quite a few competitors, as I mentioned. Um, so by 2000 or so, the mandate had actually been basically re-legislated out of existence or toned down to the point where it basically didn't matter. Um, but lots of companies had started these electric car projects and were determined to at least finish them or sell something to make some of the vast amounts of money they'd spent back. Um, and a lot of GM's competitors actually did a fair bit better. Um, Chrysler and Toyota focused quite small on their uh, electric vehicle projects. Uh, Chrysler put out the T van, an electric minivan, and they sold it, give or take, I think, 300 of those. Um, Toyota made the first electric SUV, uh, their electric vehicle conversion of the RAV4. You can see the one there in the bottom right. But again, very, very small production runs. Um, but the big winners from the mandate were hybrid cars. Uh, because one of the things that had sort of weakened the force of this mandate was clauses saying basically, if you could make cars that polluted less, they counted for a certain percentage of that mandatory zero emissions production. So lots of companies pivoted from making electrics to making hybrids when the restrictions were loosened. Um, Toyota devoted its efforts to what became known as the Prius hybrid, uh, first sold in Japan in 1997. There's one at an auto show in 97 there at the top right, and in North America in 2000. Um, and Honda uh, tried to uh, beat them to the punch with their Insight hybrid, um, which actually managed to beat the Prius to the North American market by a few months. Um, and when I talk about these hybrid cars, this is a, literally a different breed of hybrid than the Ferdinand Porsche ones we talked about earlier. You'll remember Porsche's hybrids are series hybrids. They've got a gasoline generator driving an electric motor. These are parallel hybrids where you've got an electric motor, a generator, and a gasoline engine, uh, which can all be run in different combinations. For instance, for driving slowly, you might just have the electric motor going and then you pulse on the gas engine for a little burst of speed, or you have all three of them running at once to charge the batteries and get full power on the highway. Um, this is monstrously complicated um, and can really only be run by computing technology, but hey, it's the early 2000s. Computing technology is very well established in cars right now. And suddenly these kinds of hybrids are very, very practical. Um, so hybrids make a very dramatic splash on North American roads. They sell very well and become very popular, but almost from day one, they have chronic, chronic image issues. Um, anybody who recalls watching any kind of comedy related programming uh, in the early 2000s, um, Family Guy and uh, South Park chief among them might recall the uh, many, many jokes made at the expense of Priuses uh, and their owners as uh, you know environmentally friendly, pretentious hippie types who like to smell their own farts. Um, so these kind of image problems applied industry-wide to hybrid cars and were applied to electric cars and persist to a degree to this day. Um, this is a big hurdle for the car industry to get over that, you know, hybrid and electric technology was here and was available, but everybody thought it was for dweebs. Um, now, during this time period, there is electric car production in Canada sort of at a very small scale in the sort of immediate post mandate years. Um, one of the interesting side effects of the EV mandate was a building public knowledge of the feasibility of you know, electric cars and that the knowledge the cost of this technology was way, way, way reduced compared to what it had been previously. And B, new legislation that permitted smaller, slower street legal electric vehicles that weren't necessarily um, able to go on highways, but could be street legal for local suburban and urban commuter use. 
Um, so in 1995, uh, CAN-EV of Parksville, British Columbia is founded, um, and their mighty truck, which you can see there on the left, um, is as far as I know, currently the Canadian electric vehicle that's been in the longest serial production, um, they're still building them. Uh, they're going on almost 30 years, so good for them. Um, Dynasty, uh, in, also in BC, uh, based out of Cologne, I believe, makes uh, their IT car, visible on the right there, that's a BC Hydro version, um, between 2001 and 2018. And I believe the design is currently under serial production in Pakistan. So again, these aren't highway legal vehicles. They aren't even particularly speedy, um, but they're otherwise functional and uh, you know industrial and commercial electronic cars, uh, suitable for industrial and commercial use and for short range commuting. Uh, there's a few other big ones, uh, notably Zen cars, but we'll talk more about them in a second. Um, on the sort of civilian private side of things, uh, electric car racing becomes a very popular student project at high schools and universities across Canada. On the left there, you can see some uh, uh, Electrathon racers in uh, Vancouver in 2003. And the idea there is to basically take a single commercial car battery and see how long you can make a race car run off just it. Um, in uh, Alberta in 2002, uh, an unusual case, um, Ken Norwick, who's a psychologist by profession, uh, decides he is going to convert his 96 Saturn into an electric car. Um, and he ends up building what becomes Alberta's first road registered electric car possibly ever, actually. Um, this was a new concept for the Alberta government to the point where they actually had to rewrite their paperwork for how cars were registered to allow for the possibility of an electric car. Um, and he drove it for several years and inspired a big knock-on um, DIY movement in Alberta, which has become part of the larger international DIY electric car movement where people, you know, buy electric car parts to convert their own gasoline cars into electrics. That's a very common thing for uh, the manufacture of commuter electric cars. Um, but all of these vehicles, whether they're corporate, whether they're private, whether they're hybrids, whether they're pure electrics, have the same problem. The big one, again, it's, ya yeah boy, the battery problem. The cars are getting lighter, the engines are getting more efficient, the streamlining and computer technology is growing by leaps and bounds to improve efficiency and range, but these cars are still for the most part using lead acid or nickel metal batteries. This is 1920s technology that just isn't that good. So a brief kind of look back at the history of and attempted solutions to the battery problem. Um, a lot of the new battery technology developed in the years after the Second World War just wasn't good enough. Um, Silver-based batteries, as we mentioned, had good energy density, but well, for one thing, they're made of silver, which is expensive. Uh, for another, they're short-lasting and uh, fairly heavy. Um, General Motors had, as part of their big sort of 60s car boom, um, experimented with what they called molten sulfur batteries, which were excellent, you know, great lifespan, great performance, great power um, storage. Except, of course, that they were made of literally boiling sulfur. Uh, we're talking something like 700, 800 degrees Celsius at a couple thousand atmospheres. Uh, so not practical or safe for passenger vehicles. Um, you may be familiar with the idea of hydrogen fuel cell technology. Um, it's been kind of the next big thing in the car industry for going on 60, 70 years now. Um, that idea is basically to combine hydrogen and oxygen in an engine, which then generates electricity and has uh, water as its only exhaust. Um, the problem is, while fuel cell technology is very mature and very efficient and well-developed, um, the distribution networks for it are extraordinarily complex and dangerous. Hydrogen is way harder to transport than electricity or gasoline. Uh, and the cost of building a North America wide hydrogen fuel in sort of infrastructure would be vastly, vastly more expensive than uh, probably any project in human industrial history. So, you know, fuel cells are great. They have a lot of really useful applications, but fuel cell technology will forever be one of those blue sky future projects, it's not quite attainable. Um, and in this time period, the battery technology gets fairly exotic as people try everything under the sun to develop a better battery. Um, that unusual looking vehicle on the right uh, is one of the sort of interesting standouts of uh, strange experimental battery tech. Um, that is the Subaru Sony Shinko Electro Wagon X1, um, which uh, was powered by a, a zinc based battery system that literally combusted zinc. Um, so imagine instead of filling a fuel tank with gas, you fill a fuel tank with powdered zinc, which is then shaken into battery cells, and it is catalyzed and converted and burned away and to generate power in your engine. Um, needless to say, this was not very practical. We could also go even further afield and talk about cars like the Ford Nucleon, their nuclear-powered concept car, but 
that's a whole other story. Um, and then suddenly out of the blue, out of nowhere, uh, lithium ion battery technology appears. Well, is invented by several research teams in the United States and Japan independently and then becomes commercialized uh, in 1991. So lithium ion batteries are great in a lot of ways. Not perfect, but great. Um, they've got great energy density and lifespan. Um, they're fairly reliable. Um, after a few years of work, they tended to stop dramatically catching on fire. That was a problem with early ones. Uh, but, well, lithium is a very rare metal uh, and lithium ion batteries were hard to source and to make. Uh, a couple of the electric car mandate vehicles had used lithium ions, chief among them Nissan's um, entry into the project. But basically, at large scales, these were just not economical power systems. Um, until in 2000, an American startup had a rather unusual idea. Uh, they said, what if we took hundreds of laptop scale lithium ion batteries and literally bundled them together to make one really, really big battery. Would that be enough to power a car? Uh, and it turned out it was. And what they came up with was the yellow vehicle on the left there, the T0, an electric sports car concept. Uh, now the T0 didn't end up working out for many, many very complicated reasons. Again, you could do a whole presentation just on the history of the two vehicles here. Uh, but uh, it is refined and redeveloped after several different mergers and corporate takeovers, both friendly and hostile, into the Tesla Roadster um, vehicle on the right. 80,000 US dollars, extremely high performance, and it attracts a ton of buzz around electric cars and shows that for the first time, really, um, if you're willing to pay a very high price point, uh, lithium ion technology can make an electric car that has comparable or better range and performance to a gasoline car. Another big thing that Tesla does uh, through their marketing that really helps the electric car industry as a whole is they manage to make a sexy electric car. They manage to make a car with a bit of, uh, a bit more than let's say dweeb appeal. Um, so Tesla's marketing and the sudden ubiquity of Tesla's on the roads go a long way towards making electric cars a bit more mass market than they had been in the era of energy crisis car, or sorry, uh, mandate cars and hybrids. So by the mid 2000s, pretty much all the major auto manufacturers uh, worldwide are developing either electric cars or hybrids or some combination of both. Um, and the market by about 2010 had begun to grow exponentially year over year. Um, electric cars back then and to this day are vastly more expensive and not you know, uh, particularly price efficient compared to gasoline cars, but um, the increased growth of charging infrastructure and things like government tax incentives for owning them are helping to, you know, even the playing field somewhat. Uh, between 2010 uh, and 2020, the number of electric cars worldwide uh, increased by a factor of 10. Uh, and as far as any statistician can tell, that growth rate is increasing dramatically, especially in Europe. Again, the moment we're sitting at about one in uh, sorry, 5% of cars on North American roads are electrics, and I believe the percentage in Europe is closer to eight or nine, uh, but that, that stat may be a little bit out of date. Um, in Canada, um, we see a heck of a lot more electric cars on the roads um, and a lot more electric public transit. Uh, lots of major cities begin to experiment with and test electric and hybrid buses. Um, at the moment, uh, Toronto, Vancouver, and Ottawa have all committed to having all electric transit systems by 2030, so there's going to be a lot more of them out there. Um, E-bikes and very small electrics continue to be popular. Um, in 2006 and 2010, you get uh, more and more um, limited range short uh, or low speed electrics like the Zen car um, built in Saint-Jerome, Quebec there. Uh, you'll hear more about Zen cars in the automotive museum very soon. Uh, stay tuned, this is just a brief, uh, brief teaser. Um, and lots of Canadian companies, be they small startups or big manufacturers, shift towards the supply of electric components and parts. Um, so are there electric cars made in Canada right now? Not yet, no. Um, there are a couple hybrids. Uh, the Chrysler Pacifica and the Lexus RX 450 are both hybrid cars that are built entirely in Canada. But quite a few of the major auto manufacturers have committed to a full production of electric cars in Canada, probably within the next four to five years or so. Lots of factories are in the process of being retooled or switched over. Um, at the home of the Automotive Museum in Oshawa, of course, 
uh, facilities are have been built and are being built for the testing and development of new electric, uh, electric vehicles um, and uh, self-driving electric cars. Uh, this picture here is a, a pretty cool shot of uh, one of the prototypes of the Hummer electric vehicle, uh, GM's new, new Hummer vehicle actually being tested in the uh, test center at Ontario Tech. Um, and so, yeah, electrics are coming back on the roads. They're getting ubiquitous. They're less expensive than they ever were. They're great. They're wonderful. Everything's perfect, right? Well, not quite. Uh, electric cars, yes, are good for the environment. They don't pollute. Overall, they make way less pollution even from their construction than gasoline cars do. But they still have a fairly serious environmental impact that you've got to address and talk about. Um, the big thing with electric cars is their impact, not individually, but collectively on the power grid of individual countries and well, the world. Um, basically what they're doing is shifting emissions and energy use off the individual car and onto power plants. Now in a country like Canada, where the vast majority of our energy infrastructure is well sourced from renewable sources, or green energy, that's that's not particularly bad. You know, it's easy to scale up green energy production, the power plants and the electrical grid can take it. For countries like say India or China going through an electric car boom, or even the United States for that matter, where a lot of the infrastructure is based off of coal, oil or natural gas, all you're really doing is scaling down pollution on the roads to scale it up in the power plants. Um, and the cars themselves and the materials they're made of have environmental impacts too. Uh, lithium, as I mentioned, is a fairly rare metal. Um, it's extremely reactive, which means it's difficult to find in anything like a pure form in nature. And the two most common places it's extracted from the earth are in the Salar de Atacama in uh, South America. Uh, it's roughly on the border between Chile and Argentina. Um, that photo you can see on the left there is an aerial view of a uh, lithium extraction operation on the, the cell flats. And what that involves is gigantic football field sized pools full of fresh drinking water um, through which lithium salts are pumped to basically boil and evaporate off any waste metals and separate out the pure lithium. Uh, now what this does is cause massive damage to a very delicate salt flat ecosystem and consume gigantic quantities of drinking water, which is, is extremely difficult to turn back into drinkable water afterwards. You're basically creating toxic salty water from this process to make tiny, tiny quantities of lithium. Um, elsewhere in Central Africa, it's mined, uh, as you can see in the image from the top right there, and uh, this kind of open pit mining, again with a heavy water component, uh, causes horrific environmental damage and contaminates groundwater. Uh, the nickel used in lithium ion batteries, it's uh, not the, I believe it's the third or fourth most common component in them, but don't quote me on that, um, heavily mined in Canada. That uh, chunk of rock you see in the bottom right was mined in Labrador in 2014. Um, and purifying nickel ores, well, even with green mining technology, getting the ore separated out into component nickel is again a process that creates tons of toxic runoff um, and all kinds of nasty byproducts that can seep into groundwater and cause tons of environmental problems. So all this is to say, yes, electric technology is a good thing. Electric cars are overall net benefits good for the environment. But as with any new technology, they're something we need to use carefully and responsibly. As Canadians thinking about buying electric cars, I know me and my family, we're certainly seriously discussing buying an electric car. We need to consider that while we may be helping deal with problems of greenhouse gas emissions and pollution, we may also be shifting onto new problems that we're not aware exist just yet. So this is a beneficial technology. The future for the electric car industry looks bright, but as always, we need to tread carefully and consider our next steps. So we'll end on a slightly cautionary note with this map. Uh, this is a map of every electric vehicle charging station in North America, uh, circa give or take November, 2021. I think there are a lot more green dots on there nowadays. Um, we're looking at give or take 150,000 charging stations, I believe continent wide, of which somewhere in the area of I think 50 or 60,000 are in Canada. And that number is growing weekly. They're out there and there's more of them coming and you will be able to drive to all these places in your electric car someday. Uh, but that is where we will end, or well, I will end for this evening and open it up to the floor. Um, thank you all so much. If you've got any questions or comments, please let me know. And uh, let's, let's chat about the electric car and its history and possibly its future. Thank you all so very much.